We interrupt our program with a special bulletin. An unidentified object has been spotted in orbit around the Earth. Greetings, invaders. My name is Scott. This is Book Invasion. Welcome. Thanks for watching. Today we're going to be talking about the ever-hyped Gideon the Ninth and what I thought about it. So I didn't have a lot of expectations going into this book. I knew it was lesbian necromancers in space, and people were freaking out, like, give me that, I love it, oh, that's great, um, and all that kind of jazz. So that's kind of all I knew about it. I didn't read the synopsis uh, about what was going on when I started it, um, but it was a bit different than what I had assumed, and I think a lot of people did too. There are a lot of different reviews. There's five-star reviews, there's one-star reviews, people loved it, people hated it. So let's get into it. Brought up by unfriendly, ossifying nuns, ancient retainers, and countless skeletons, Gideon is ready to abandon the life of servitude and an afterlife as a reanimated corpse. She packs up her sword, her shoes, and her dirty magazines and prepares to launch her daring escape. But her childhood nemesis won't set her free without a service. Harrow Hark, known Jessimus, reverend daughter of the Ninth House and Bone Witch Extraordinaire, has been summoned into action. The Emperor has invited the heirs to each of his loyal houses to a deadly trial of wits and skill. If Harrowhark succeeds, she will become an immortal, all-powerful servant of the resurrection, but no necromancer can ascend without their cavalier. Without Gideon's sword, Harrow will fail, and the Ninth House will die. Of course, some things are better left dead." So I got a, a few different feelings from this book. Like, initially, it was kind of a, a quest to the throne kind of thing, where and the king and the queen of the house are now kind of old and decrepit and worthless, but there's other reasons why that is. And now the heirs to the houses, all nine houses, have to go to some place for these trials um, to become the next servant of the Lord, the Emperor, uh, the Necrolord Prime, the Lord Undying, whatever you want to call it. He has different names in this book. And so I thought, okay, so now we're going to have you know, the, the Hunger Games thing, or it's going to be, um, you know, like a, a Red Rising thing, where all of these different houses and segments, people with different skill sets, all going to a central place to compete in some kind of trials to become uh, the king of this. So, uh, so that was kind of, I was kind of skeptical, and like, oh, okay, here we go with one of these stories again. And so in the first act, it's, the book is broken up into different acts, so act one is more of um, the initiating events, uh, Gideon's trying to go out of the castle to no longer be a servant, to no longer be a, a servant to the Ninth House, but as she's trying to get out, um, Herarch stops her, thwarts her things and says, hey, if you do this one thing for me, even though we hate each other, and there's a lot of bickering back and forth between Gideon and, and Harrowhark, uh, because they're just rivals since childhood. And Harrowhark says, look, I know you hate me, um, I am the heir to the throne, and I need a cavalier, like a, a bodyguard, a person, a warrior, uh, associate or of something, to come with me to go to the first house and complete these trials. I want you to do it. If you do it for me, then you can have all of your freedom. And Gideon says, nah, 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 we, I hate you, go suck a you-know-what, um, but okay, I'll do it. So there you go. And then Act 2 is them kind of going through to the first house where all of the other houses are gathered. Now, the, the, the houses, we don't really know a lot about. We know that they are on different um, planets within some kind of solar system, and they all take shuttles to go to the first house. So so Gideon is kind of looking out the window of their shuttle and she's seeing all of these other shuttles come and she's seeing the blue expanse of the first house's planets. Uh, I guess it's uh, like ocean, there's oceans around the castle and the Canaan house and you know whatnot. So the way the ninth houses are, are, are divided are very kind of <laughs> are very complex a little bit. It's a bit much to go into without it's a bit much to go into without having kind of the descriptions in the front of the book. So I, I had gotten the physical book of this and I listened to the audio. And thank goodness I had the physical because the the first, you know, 
directory of the people, the pers dramatis personae, describes all the houses, who the people are, and what the houses' role is in the world, and, and that was really helpful to, for me to to see as I was listening to this thing. So the first house, I'll break it down a little bit for you. The first house is the king of the nine renewals, the necrolord prime, the emperor, and his lictors. Uh, his lictors, I guess, are his level above a priest or something like that. Um, and then the priesthood of the Canaan house. So I suppose the king, I don't know if he lives in the Canaan house, which I don't think he lives somewhere. Um, and so he's been, a, the king has been away for 10,000 years, and now he's come back from who knows where. And he sent this letter out to all the nine houses saying, send me your heirs and send me their cavaliers. We're going to have a trial at the Canaan house and see who's going to win the puzzles and things like that. So the second house is the Emperor's Strength, uh, the Centurion's house. And these each house has a different way that they, they refer to their heirs or their people as. So in the second house, they have captains and lieutenant of the cohort. Um, the third house is the mouth of the Emperor, the procession. Those are called the Princess and Prince of Ida. Still with me? Fourth house is the, ho the hope of the Emperor, the Emperor's sword. Though they are known, known as the Baron and the Knight of Tysus. Fifth is the heart of the Emperor, watchers over the river. They are the Lady and Cynical of Coniortos Court. I did listen to this on audio, but I don't remember how to pronounce it. The sixth house is the Emperor's Reason, Master Warden, so they are the Wardens of the Library. The seventh house is the Joy of the Emperor, they are the Duchess and Knight of Rhodes. The Eighth House is the Keepers of the Tome. They are Master Templar, Knight Templar of the White Glass. Um, the Ninth House is Keepers of the Locked Tomb. House of the Sewn Tongue, the Black Vestals. They are known as the Reverend Daughter of Dreerborough. Dreerborough. So you got all that? So throughout the book, they're, ref they're referenced here as, where's the captain? Okay, princess. Uh, lady. Yes, lady. Oh, yes, Reverend Daughter. Uh, where's the Duchess? Um, where's the Warden? Uh, where's the Lieutenant of the Cohort? So they're referenced not by only their names, which are also kind of convoluted and, and a little bit crazy. They're referenced by these titles, and so if you don't have... You should print this out and put it on a post-it note in the front, or use it as your bookmark, because you're going to need it a lot of times. And I think that lends a lot of confusion to the book. If I had listened to this just on audio, I would have been completely lost on who the F is what, and I didn't know what was going on. So anyway, after they all gather to the first house, then they're met by um, Teacher, is, is his name. So the, obviously there's an old man who takes care of the Canaan house, named Teacher. And the Canaan house is described um, as a wraith-like, mansion-like hulk that has broken windows, it has mossy windows, there's green light filtering through it. So it's... It's centuries old, they say, and they find a cent like ancient uh, flimsy, is what they call paper, Gideon calls paper flimsy, written in ancient black, black ink, is how they say it. And it's, uh, they, they go into one of the part of the cannon house and they see this, this ancient toothbrush with elec that's electric and has buttons on it, like an ancient electric toothbrush. So who knows where a cannon house if it was a present day kind of thing, and now we're, this takes all takes place in a far-reaching future, I, I don't know. So, so the timeline of this is really weird. There's electronic light bulbs uh, and lights that need to be flicked on. So who knows where this Canaan house and the origins of it are. I don't know. That was a little bit foggy. And so what we gather, as, as they go into the first house, um, since Gideon isn't the true Ninth House Cavalier, Harrowhark um, tells her to go to tell everybody she's on a vow of silence and not to talk to anybody, don't do anything stupid, and Harrowhark kind of disappears and goes away and leaves notes for Gideon to say, don't screw anything up, I'm going to go do things, you just be quiet, don't say anything. And so we get a lot of, in, in the initial part of where all of these houses meet together, uh, we get a lot of the other houses talking to Gideon we learned a lot of things about how they talk to each other, and Gideon is more of just the observer uh, of all of these other things, which is kind of a good thing where you kind of get 
you bring the other characters in a bit more without Gideon having to be vocalizing and participating as much. He's more of an observer. But then that stops eventually, and Gideon takes part and becomes part of more of the story. So after they're in Canaan House, what, what this book kind of turns into is other, other people have mentioned like a murder mystery story. I had a lot of vibes from um, Cabin in the Woods is where a group of people go to this, this cabin, this mansion, and then they go to these quote-unquote trials, and then lights go out, lights come on, somebody's dead, or somebody's missing. And where's the body? Who did it? Somebody's behind this. Who's running things? It, it always felt like there was a higher, you know, the people in the cabin in the woods in, in the control room flicking on the different switches for different traps. And it was kind of like that meets, you know, Clue or something like that, like a murder mystery thing. Like, who did it? Where's these people? And they're, they don't know really, they lack trust with each other. And then the people that they don't trust the most end up dying, and then more people end up dying. So it's it, it was kind of a good mystery, and it and you know while they're in Canaan House, you lose like the sci-fi elements anymore. It's a bit of just uh, uh, people battling skeletons and wraiths and things like that. There's not really a focus on like the female female romance at all. That's in play like a, a little bit, and and. I felt like, you know, it was a, a very minuscule part of the story. And so, you know, going through this book and reading it from that point and then to the ending, it was really just kind of um, necromancers in a house competing against each other and competing in these various trials to gain the title of, of Lictor, which means you get to serve the Lord, the Emperor. Whenever I, whenever I say the Emperor, I think of the Emperor in the Dark Crystal. Like, I, I am still Emperor, and then he crumbles and falls apart. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but, so, everyone kind of wants to do that. They want to show off how smart they are with their different powers of necromancy. Each house kind of has a different focus, whether it be knowledge or power or strength. Um, bone magic and things like that. Blood magic. Healing. There's different pieces of things in play from all these different houses and how they compete the trials. Sometimes they have to work together, sometimes not. And it, it really, just, it's just most of the book is just that, is where you just kind of get more of the trials of necromancers, is, is what you could have called this. And then, you know, they all go to a house, they compete the trials, so on and so forth. So, that's kind of what I got from the book. It wasn't really uh, uh, very... Uh, it didn't have a very strong wow factor to me. I feel like the writing was, was good. I mean, it was very... The language of it was very colorful. There were a lot of adjectives and there were a lot of big words and things that kind of lend itself to ancient texts in ancient times, but it, this was a story that took place in the future. So the writing of this was definitely a little bit advanced in the terminology and the nomenclature and so on and so forth of what um, the author used here. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So the book, really, I felt, yes, it was... It was interesting. It, it held me into the story. There were, um, I've marked a few things. There were a lot of snark in here, as, as you've heard people say. There were two instances where Gideon does a, that's what she said, um, joke, wh which I bookmarked here. There's, I, marked, I found two of them. Um, there's a few other cringe moments um, where they're solving a puzzle, and Harrowhark says, This calls for rigor, Nav. Maybe rigor mortis, said Gideon, who assumed that puns were funny automatically. And it was like, eh, cringe. And then she gets the key, uh, and then she says, She held out the key to Gideon. Put it in the hole, Git. Put it in the hole, Griddle. That's what she said, said Gideon, and she took the ring from Harrow's gloved fingers. Womp womp. Um, there was one other time here where it says um, they're working with bones. Harrow says, this won't work. She said, I've never had to work with something this small before. That's what she said, murmured Gideon. So there's little jabs here. There's a bunch of name calling between Gideon and Harrow that are just, you know, endearing. And, and it leads to the enemies to f friends kind of thing. Not to spoil anything. But there's a lot of guilt here from Gideon and Harrow's, you know, they confront their own um, their own actions towards each other in the book here, so there's some kind of closure about that. 
So overall, you know, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I thought it was entertaining. I didn't think it was fantastic. I thought the writing was a bit unique. I would like the world outside of these houses to be explored more, and I would like to see, you know, the, the origins of the Necrolord Prime and, and how this, how this, how we got to dividing up things into nine houses and who did it and all that stuff. I would like more of that kind of story. Um, but Gideon the Ninth, I'm sure, will be an expanded universe in future books. So I thought it was entertaining. I didn't think it was fantastic. Um, I liked the snark. It kind of kept it going a little bit, so it put a, a little bit more of a lighter touch on things. Um, but those are kind of my thoughts, more of a summary of the book. Like and subscribe if you want more of this good stuff, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.